down to South America this first hour to talk to Dr. Richard Sauter, Ph.D. Dr. Sauter is well-known all around the world for his extraordinary books on underground bases and tunnels, and I can only hope that he will update that whole field at some time in the near future because we know they have been digging, they, those who would seek to control all of us from cradle to grave, in fact, even before cradle to grave, that they are digging and digging and digging, and there are potentially and probably massive underground high-speed rail or maglev systems uh, running over much of these formerly United States, through which these people transit, and what they're doing down there is anybody's guess. Uh, there could be just absolute science fiction developments underground, and probably are. Richard, how are you, and welcome back. Thank you, Jeff. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm glad you're there. It's, we've, had, we've had some problems, but you sound great. Yes, you know, um, what you're saying about the underground agenda and also the underwater agenda is very real. I don't know if I will ever update those books. I was discussing that recently with someone else mm -hmm. in that it's very difficult to do the kind of research that I did in the mid uh, to late 1990s now because of all of the um, changes in laws and regulations and the extremely repressive policing of all kinds of agencies across the board. It's much harder to access data uh, than it was before. Oh, yeah. And it's true that it's true that the Internet is much more widespread than it was, say, 10 or 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. However, it's also true that if you notice, quite a lot of the information on the Internet is very superficial. And there are a lot of um, uh, data repositories that are very difficult to access over the Internet. Not everything is online. And a lot of the data that I uh, got my hands on back in the 1990s uh, came to me either through the Freedom of Information Act or through physically going to a wide variety of, of um, data repositories and document repositories. Now it would be difficult to get in a lot of those places and do that kind of research and agencies mm -hmm. uh, are not going to let um, uh, not going to let you or going, me in there no um, no they're, they're not going to give no. access to information now the way that they did 20 years ago that is just a hard fact of life so what we know however based on my research and the work of some other people is that there are quite a lot of underground bases they have been constructed by a surprisingly wide range of agencies, both governmental and non-governmental. The military, meaning especially, but not only, the United States military, um, have built a, quite a lot of underground and undersea facilities, but not only them. They are not the only game in town. They are a major player, mm -hmm. but they are not the only one. And it's not only in, in the United States that this has been done. I think I've mentioned before on your show that the Israelis, for example, have underground facilities. The Saudis do out in the desert. Uh, the French certainly do. Mm -hmm. The English do. Uh, the Chinese do. In fact, the Chinese uh, reportedly have constructed thousands of miles of underground tunnels in which they have based mobile nuclear missiles. And the Russians, of course, have major underground facilities. Perhaps the best known is the big underground base in the vicinity of uh, Yamantau Mountain in the Ural Mountains. And and, and, and on and on, the, the Scandinavians are well known for their um, underground uh, civil engineering expertise and et cetera, et cetera. So 
it's not only the United States uh, agencies that have done this. It's been done all around the world. However, there has been an extraordinarily a large amount of underground excavation done in the United States going right back to the World War II era, and I think even before. Um, and I discuss this in my uh, 2010 book, Hidden in Plain Sight Beyond the X-Files, uh-huh. how the um, Project Paperclip had a number of different compartments. It was a compartmentalized operation run on a need-to-know uh, basis, and most people have focused heavily on the the aspect having to do with literally with rocket science. Werner von Braun and his and his team mm-hmm. who came over and worked for the military. They helped develop the military's first ballistic missiles, including the first nuclear missiles, and also the um, whole suite of NASA rockets extending up to the Saturn V moon rocket and they were definitely heavily involved in NASA and the military agencies but the um, rocket science aspect of Project Paperclip was not to be all and end all of that project. There were other compartments including psychiatry, space science space medical science uh, and also the militaries, the American militaries, underground plant program, which started right after World War II and had important input from uh, Nazi engineers uh, with expertise in underground base and tunnel construction. Mm-hmm. Well, it <clears> said that uh, for, for I, I provide documentation of that using yeah. a couple of original uh, Project Paperclip memos from 1947 and I reproduce those in my book Hidden in Plain Sight Beyond the X-Files I've uh, f- forgotten what the ratio is but there is an extraordinarily enormous amount of underground this is column facilities in Berlin something like for every two square feet above or three square feet above ground there's one square foot below ground. I, I, it was it was quite shocking, the amount of yeah. Well, the, my, the people Nazis, don't. The Nazis did yeah. a lot of underground excavation. So did the Japanese. Um, one of my sources told me uh, we were discussing, uh, you know, the presence of, um, shall we so, shall I say, um, clandestine. Uh, underground facilities in Japan uh-huh. in the present day. Mm-hmm. And he observed, well, you know, the Japanese are very digging people. And indeed they are. Although what's going on at Fukushima Daiichi, uh, at the nuclear complex there, is a catastrophe and could well spend the, spell the end of a great deal of biological life on this planet. Uh, that notwithstanding, there is a very advanced uh, engineering and technological base in Japan Mm -hmm. going right back to the World War II period and even before. The Japanese are, um, they have a very, they're very clever, clever people. They're technologically oriented. Well, look what they did Uh, on Iwo Jima. Uh, The tunnel structure in there was uh, extraordinary. That's an eight square mile piece of rock and it, it took a terrible toll to go in there and take that as a conquest. It was a very difficult well, Admiral thing. Nimitz, Admiral Nimitz threw the best forces that he had uh, at Iwo Jima, and it took everything the American military had in the Pacific Theater at that time, two months, to conquer that little rock in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Two right. months. Yep. It's just throwing tens of thousands of troops at it. And a, a god awful bomb, bomb offshore bombardment. Just who knows how many tons of artillery shells and and uh, two months it took to conquer that place. Now, um, the other aspect of that is the under undersea um, installations, 
And I actually did a, a show recently with one of your competitors, whom I won't name, on your show. But he actually was in the Navy and served uh, part of the time. One of the places he served was at Altec, which is um, a naval facility, a United States naval facility in the Bahamas on Andros Island. Altec. It's been there, yes, Mm-hmm. It's been there for more than half a century. It goes back, oh, to before the John F. Kennedy administration. Um, it's a major submarine warfare installation. Altec is a sensitive um, installation, and what I was told is that up to five or six Ohio-class submarines can come into the underwater dry deck at Altec through uh, undersea tunnels. Now, these submarines are, are huge. They're like 600 feet long and right. over 100 feet from the bottom of the hull to the top of the conning tower. They're, they're quite large vessels. So to bring multiple vessels like that in through underwater tunnels into an underground base at Altec mm-hmm. um, is perfectly consistent with what I have res- uh, revealed in my my second book, Underwater and Underground Bases. We have satellite my, photos of uh, Chinese underground submarine bases, entries. Well, on Hainan, on Hainan Island, the Chinese have a, a similar facility, analogous to what I've been told about Altec, where they have undersea tunnels, and they bring in their big military submarines mm-hmm. into an underground base, and they dock underground. Right. Um, but the thing about this is that this this technology, I have documentation for this type of base or Navy plans for it going back to the mid-1960s to 1966. This is, this type of facility is very much along the lines of the so-called rock site plans developed by the United States Navy at... Um, China Lake Naval Weapons Station mm-hmm. back in the 1960s. They did research and design work on this type of base. Uh, and in fact, I provide illustrations in my second and third book, in both my book, Underwater and Underground Bases, and then the book, Hidden in Plain Sight, Beyond the X-Files, of just this type of base where um, the Navy planned to bring in multiple large um, military submarines and their crews to underground bases, and they would bring them in through through tunnels undersea. And there are three ways uh, identified in the literature to do this. And this is not classified. These are documents that um, are on the public record, or at least were when I was doing my research. Uh, and I might add that Stanford Research Institute in California, also produced a similar document, which I also cite in Hidden in Plain Sight, uh, in which they discussed the same type of undersea base, where submarines would actually dock and crews would be um, actually be uh, put into these bases, which could be hundreds or even thousands of feet undersea down in the bedrock. They would actually tunnel out and excavate bases. And then there would be airlocks, you see, where submarines could come and go and exchange crews and supplies. Uh, The airlocks could be quite massive, large enough for big submarines to go in to the base through massive airlocks. People have to understand how powerful marine engineering technology was already back in the 1960s, mm-hmm. and we're, fif- we're 50 years further down the road. 